world. So my name is Hanad al-Masri. I'm an associate professor of Arabic in MENA at Denison University. And I'm uh, joined today by my team members, Cheryl Johnson and uh, Olivia Reynolds. Uh, unfortunately, our second student presenter was not able to join us today. So I want to um, invite my co-presenters, uh, give them a minute maybe to uh, briefly introduce themselves. Cheryl? Hi, I'm Cheryl Johnson, and I'm an instructional technologist for the Department of Modern Languages at Denison. Um, and I've become very interested in this project when Hanada brought it to me, her um, idea. Um, and I think that this has been a wonderful collaboration with her and with her students. Olivia? Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Olivia. I am a senior at Denison University. Uh, I joined this project because I took two semesters of Arabic with Professor Al Masri, and I really wanted to take up the challenge, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you both. So uh, just to give a little background, um, similar to the Grinnell context, uh, Denison University is a private liberal arts um, university in the village of Granville, Ohio, uh, with around uh, 2,300 um, undergraduate students and a population of 6,000 uh, people. Uh, it's worth noting, though, that there is no presence of Arab American community except for my family. And so inspired by the limitation of the space and location, um, also by my positionality as an Arab American myself, as a professor of Arabic, as a one person a program, uh, I really thought of this project in order to give opportunities for my students to practice the language with native speakers of Arabic. Um, so uh, Cheryl, next slide, please. Oh, this slide, it's okay. So now our project is entitled um, Oral History, um, uh, digital collection project, the Arab American community in central Ohio, and the theme is negotiating cultural identities and adapting traditions. So in today's presentation, uh, we will demonstrate how a group of um, Arabic and Middle East and North African studies uh, students came together to create this digital archive uh, about Ameri Arab Americans. Uh, I personally will start with uh, addressing the logistical and pedagogical aspects of the project and uh, the process of building the archive. Uh, and maybe towards the end of the group presentation, I'll talk about the challenges that we faced and uh, uh, the next step of how I use this archive into my own teaching. Cheryl will be talking about uh, and demonstrating the technological aspect and showing the platforms that we've used. And of course, our amazing uh, student will be talking about uh, her experiences as a knowledge producer in this uh, project. Uh, next, please. Uh, so this project started in the fall of 2018 uh, with the support uh, of uh, the, digi the uh, five colleges of Ohio Mellon, Mellon Digital Collection Grant. Uh, we also got support from Denison University Research Foundation, the Liska Center for Scholarly Engagement, Alfred Community Leadership and Involvement Center, and Modern Languages uh, Paddy Forsman Fund. Um, so, uh, First and foremost, the project was created with the goal of enriching our students' experiences and connecting uh, their learning experience in class with a digital tool and with a community outreach to develop many skills, linguistic, interpersonal, presentational, intercultural, and all of these skills, as we all know, are primary components of the 21st century uh, learning framework. And so um, according to this student-centered project, um, which aims at creating that archive. We're collecting the histories and stories of, of Arab Americans in central Ohio. Uh, it's a large and diverse community, by the way. It has lots of cultural, socioeconomic, linguistic, educational backgrounds coming from 22 Arab countries. And in Ohio, they're centered in cities like Columbus, Dayton, Cleveland, Toledo, and Cincinnati. So uh, for the um, outcomes we hope to achieve in this project, uh, there are many facets really. So academically, we wanted to, prod to broaden our students' understanding of the Arab American community and also share that with the general American public through the platform. Uh, we wanted to provide an opportunity for MENA students to conduct research with the Middle Eastern community. Uh, and this is part of the requirements for MENA uh, that if students cannot travel abroad, then they can do a research project in a predominantly uh, uh, Middle Eastern community. 
We also wanted to focus on civic engagement and wanted to give back to the local community of Arab Americans by providing them with the cultural visibility that they deserve. So we do this through highlighting their contributions and engagement to their local, local communities. Um, we also want to minimize and eliminate misconceptions, especially that not all Arabs in America are refugees, first of all. And also, uh, we wanted to combat the negative stereotypes and biases that are normally associated with Arabs, especially um, more so in, in today's political climate. And professionally, uh, we wanted to um, uh, create this as an open resource for other teachers of Arabic to use in their classrooms as well. As for our narrators, so uh, they represent diverse educational and socioeconomic backgrounds. They have migrated to the United States for a long, since a long time. So some of them have been here for over 40 years. And uh, our most recent interviewee was here for the past 15 years. So all are Arab Americans with the exception of one narrator who was um, a first generation Arab American. So the main research question that we wanted to tackle in this project is how do Arab Americans navigate their hyphenated identity? And so the, under this broader theme, we had uh, uh, three subfields for interview questions that cover the aspects of mobility and migration, uh, identity formation and cultural aspects and how the Arab community is adapting to their traditions from home to the new home. As for the interview format, so we, we collected six face-to-face um, uh, -face video interviews. Uh, the language of the interviews was both Arabic and English, depending on the speakers. Uh, and and uh, these interviews range between 40 minutes to 45 minutes um, in total. Um, so let's see. Yeah, next, please. And so as, as you can all see, this is really, really a collaborative project. So we had students at the center of this as the producers of knowledge. Our, so we started with a, with a total of nine team members. They came from different disciplinary backgrounds and they all shared um, the, the fact that they have studied Arabic either as beginner or intermediate students. Uh, and we have Olivia as an example. Uh, all of them were really uh, uh, very enthusiastic, very dedicated, very passionate about the topic. When I mentioned the idea, they jumped to it. They're not taking credit for it, uh, except of course, after they, the, the MENA student who thought about their own research, but, but they really liked the idea of breaking out of the classroom context, out of the textbook, and, and really start producing the knowledge. And of course, uh, this, this project would not have been possible at all digitally without the help of Cheryl. Uh, we are really fortunate to have her in our department. So Cheryl is responsible for all the digital back channeling of the project. We had uh, the director of the library, Debra Indiades, who is uh, responsible for hiring students officially in the project and overseeing the budget. And of course, our gratitude uh, go to the Arab American community who really volunteered, who were very passionate, who came forward to share their stories. Uh, they opened their homes and, and their hearts to really share, share their past experiences, their present experiences and their future aspirations with me and my team members. Um, so moving to the uh, project phases, we had uh, six phases. The first one was uh, an introductory phase that started, so the project started in August, officially 2018. And so the preparatory stage started in July. Uh, we started building connections with the Arab American community. We narrowed down it and, and identified the community members involved. Um, then we consulted different resources for students to build their literature and knowledge about Arab Americans in, in, in the US in general and in Ohio in particular. Uh, me, Cheryl, all students in the team member, we acquired a IRB certification. Um, then we prepared consent and release forms and we took care of any copyright issues. So all of that was done before, uh, the, uh, before our students came back to campus. For the second stage, it started in the, sec in the first week of, of this semester. And Jara and I conducted a two-day workshop interview and that was really one of the primary factors that made this project successful. Uh, so students got basic familiarization about Arabic culture and, you know, the, the protocols of, of uh, and norms of going into an Arab house and what to do and what not to do. And then uh, they were pre uh, prepared and, and trained for proper in, uh, interviewing techniques, 
technical training, we did mock interviews, um, and I will let Cheryl talk more about this uh, um, in a minute. The third and fourth phases were parallel. So this is when Cheryl started setting up the platform to host the project. And at the same time, the students and I went together to the first interview. So we conducted that face interview, we reflected on it, we reflected particularly on the content and the type of questions before we moved on to the fifth stage, which I call the TTD force, that is the translate, transcribe, and digitize. So uh, all team members were supposed to play the role of interviewers and then transcribers, uh, depending or, uh, on their linguistic proficiency, uh, translators, and then uh, we had two students who worked as the digitizers in the project, one with a cinema major and one was a theater major. And uh, of course, the, the last stage would be to have the public posting on the uh, website. So uh, with that, I will turn it to Cheryl to display the uh, logical, the uh, pedagogical digital aspect of it. So after reviewing several oral history books that had been recommended to me when I attended a, a workshop um, the summer prior, um, I settled on this particular one, Practicing Critical Oral History, Connecting School and Community by Christine K. Lemley. Um, she wrote it for really a um, middle school, high school audience, but it it's excellent in giving you these five R's. And it's really an excellent basis for um, grounding your, uh, this type of work. So um, it begins with the section on reflexivity. And that, of course, is um, what Hanada spent um, a lot of time on with her students, um, with, with uh, examining our our own cultural biases and um, really thinking about um, what is appropriate upon entering someone's home that is from a different culture and just spending that time to, um, to reflect. And um, then moving on to that re relationality and your responsibility when you are forming these relationships, how to responsibly um, retain um, as a co-creator in this oral history. That's one of the things that's heavily um, uh, stressed in this uh, small text um, because you really are co-creating with them a story, um, but you, you want to make sure that um, their story is being well represented um, with the full respect that it deserves. And also this um, element of reciprocity. Um, what does this do for the community? Uh, so this is really um, the foundation upon which we worked um, to build this, um, this database of oral histories uh, with the students. Uh, how we uh, organized the project was using the Google Drive. We are a Google school. Um, we use this drive to uh, maintain all of our um, documents um, as well as our videos. And then um, we created our public site using Omeka and ohms which is a video um, uh, pro um, product that um, allows transcription and translation to show up and this was something that was created at the university of kentucky um, actually by one of um, denison's alums so i'm going to um, get out of here and we will go over to our um, Arab American Community Project Drive and you see how we have um, organized the structure. Um, we have um, a section called uh, process documentation and that's where we put our preparation and uh, orientation materials, um, our roadmap for the project, etc. 
Um, and then uh, we have our deliverable section in here. Um, so this is where we have our student reflections, the questionnaires. So you see how we've broken things um, up uh, in order to uh, keep track of it. Uh, within the data, we have our uh, interview, our videos and our audio, transcriptions, translations. So then um, I could take this data and move it on over into, um, first, I worked within ohms. So this is the back end of the oral history metadata synchronizer that I referred to as being a, uh, a piece of software that um, was developed at the University of Kentucky. Um, so this is where we put our metadata um, and uh, put all of this information that you see, we, the interviewer was Alexis, our interviewee was Wafa. Um, we can put in all kinds of um, write statements, usage, et cetera. So that is the back end there. Um, and um, we can t see a preview of this particular video. And you see down here, I can click and jump to a particular subject. So if I want to go to that, um, to focus in on that research question about negotiating these identities, preserving your own cultural identity within the US um, identity, I can jump right to this when Wafa speaks about how she preserves her culture by clicking play segment and um, it will jump to that segment and we can listen to that. Um, plus, we can add in a partial transcript. We also have the ability to switch to the first transcript, and you see that it is all time coded, um, and we can jump um, to that particular section. Um, we also have the ability uh, to switch to the Arabic view for that translation. And then if I could read Arabic, you would um, uh, know exactly what this says, but I am ignorant in that area. Uh, again, I can play that segment and listen to that portion. So that is what um, we have been pulling in to our public website, um, uh, the Arab American Project, so Arab-American-Project.org. And we have our homepage at this point um, going to the About section. The Browse Items um, allows you to see what we have added to Omeka. So we do have some still images that we have um, put up there. And then we have uh, the various interviews. Um, so I can then click into a particular interview and whoop, we're a little unstable there. Give it a moment. Okay. So you see the same thing as what I showed you a moment ago. And here is all of the metadata. So that gives you an idea of what the front end looks um, like to the public. Let me now return to our presentation. And I'll turn it over to Olivia at this point. Uh, so hello again, everyone. Uh, my name is Olivia. Like I said earlier, I'm a senior at Denison and I, take, I, I took um, two semesters of Arabic. So I'll describe first like what my role was and then I'll talk about what I learned from the experience. So um, my role was interviewer and I also helped translate and transcribe. 
Um, going into the interviews was kind of uh, nerve wracking for me. I'm generally a shy person and speaking in Arabic is not my first language. So it was a little difficult, uh, especially conveying information and uh, you know having that kind of relationship. But it was a really worthwhile experience. I learned so much from it. Um, I think the interviews are my favorite part because um, you have to learn from people and got to interact with people in their homes. And we've got to interact and chat and they were so hospitable and they shared food and culture and they showed us artifacts from their homes, pictures and medals and other things like that. It was just a, a wonderful experience in general. Um, the language part was pretty difficult for me, especially, um, but we had other teammates who were probably a little better adept at languages. Um, after the interviews, uh, we had the translation and transcription process. So uh, there was hours of footage and we had to go through minute by minute and just transcribe all of what was said, uh, like not taking care to get all of the pauses and um, the intricacies of language, I guess. Um, there's definitely lots of set phrases that I remember learning in Arabic that I was like, oh, I, I can hear that now uh, in all the um, interviews we had. So it was, it was a learning experience for me. Uh, the transcription part especially was difficult. Um, just the formatting, I think it was said in the previous presentation, the formatting of uh, other languages in Microsoft Office is not very efficient, uh, especially Arabic, it's written from, uh, from right to left instead of left to right. So formatting was a little difficult to switch between languages. Um, but yeah, uh, next I'll talk about what I learned from the experience. Um, I think the most compelling uh, thing that I learned was, um, was the negotiation of identity and how these people would, um, kind of stay true to their roots and negotiate plural identities, Arab American. They were from all over the Arab world, from Egypt, from Syria, from Palestine and Jordan. And they are very, not nationalistic, but they, they love their country. They love where they come from, even though they may have come from some place that was maybe had civil unrest and they came here for opportunities. Once they got here, they came and started from basically, you know, level one. Like they had to start over basically, um, but they made it. And it was really inspirational to hear their, their stories of like coming up and, and really becoming successful. And, you know, uh, I also enjoyed when they were talking about how they share their culture with other people especially their neighbors and families, and um, how they keep their identity within their families. I think one of the interviewees was talking about how she puts her children into um, like a religious school or a culture school where she can learn more about Arab culture, about Islam, and about the Quran. And that's really important about keeping their identities and sharing their identities. Uh, one cute story I remember offhand was, um, I think it was Wafa, who was talking about her daughter going to a neighbor's house uh, and they were eating s'mores, but uh, marshmallows are haram because they have gelatin. So she went back to the house and got um, gelatin-free marshmallows and brought them over and like taught her friends about you know Arab culture and Islam and I thought that was a really cute way of compromise and sharing cultural identity. Um, now I'll talk about what my other friends and students talked about. Uh, this is from Adam um, who was a videographer for the project. He said uh, going into this project I wasn't sure what to expect. I'd never done anything like this before 
each interview I go on, I'm continually surprised and delighted by these stories. Sorry. The homes, <laughs> no problem. Uh, the stories, the homes, the families, their similarities and their differences. The hospitality is overwhelming and editing has been a blast getting to relive each experience as has the ability to work with everyone else involved in the project. Next slide. Uh, this is from Jimmy. Lightning for me. It was deeply saddening to hear about their struggles as well. Alienation and harassment were both common themes throughout the interviews. Hearing about these negative experiences really affirmed my belief in the importance of this project so that others can learn about the experiences, fellow Americans, and feel the need for change as I did. I had to go off of that slide, um, basically what he was talking about, the common issue about harassment and discrimination. I, one of the stories was um, uh, at like one of the mosques, local mosques, there was uh, uh, a protester and uh, basically the protesters, pr protester was being very hateful. So someone from the mosque went out and talked to her and invited her in and you know asked for a hug and really had a good conversation with her to the point where the protester like changed her mind and was kind of, you know, she learned about Islam and learned about Arab Arabs because maybe she learned from the media that, you know, ter about Arabs as terrorists and things like that. So she was scared and maybe misinformed. So uh, just having that one-on-one -on -one experience helped her. Um, this next one is from Victoria. When I first heard about this project, I was extremely excited to get started. Being an Arab American myself, I have personally experienced the way that people treat you differently just for being Arab. I was especially looking forward to meeting new people who have experienced some of the things that I have experienced too. Next slide. Uh, this is from Hannah. The interviewing experience has been different with the oral history project. This is less about my manipulation of the material and more about conveying their stories in the most compelling way possible. These stories are often humorous, saddening, heartening, and inspiring. To simply be a, a piece informing the stories to be shared to a larger audience has been humbling and an honor. To others considering doing a project like this, absolutely do it. This, is the, this kind of thing is absolutely scary, but extraordinary things can come from stepping outside of your comfort zone. Okay, that covers all of our student comments. Um, Olivia, can you comment a little bit uh, very briefly about um, the experience for the orientation that we gave you with practicing um, the interview skills? I figured it would be better from your perspective than mine. Yeah, we took a lot of training. Uh, I remember the IRB testing about how to um, how to go into the interviews with respect and learning those kind of, not conversation skills, communication skills and that kind of thing. Um, the most helpful part for me was the um, practicing, um, practicing the interviews because I was particularly nervous uh, going Um, thank you, Olivia. Also, I mean, I would like to highlight that, I mean, as we can tell from students' uh, reflections and, and that of Olivia, uh, all of these embody the, the spirit of, of liberal arts education, how students are engaged civically, how they collaborating with each other, how they're connecting with their outside community, and, and how they're also becoming empathetic about issues that they were not aware of.